Okay, so I want to go over something we saw in the study tonight. Um, I saw a visual while we were studying in my head, and thus this picture. And I, I hope this visual, I'm a visual person, so I get messages either in the scripture itself or in a picture of the scripture. That's how I get revelations and stuff. It's just how I see stuff in my head. Um, and I wanted to share it with you so that you can be set free from any concern of ever thinking part of the old covenant is is this new covenant okay so that's why you have this picture be reminded of that now in a nutshell what is, all of hebrews is saying is the new covenant is the actual promise okay and so in between the promise and the new covenant coming the old what we call the old covenant was given right because that old covenant had some purposes, but one of them is to make us guilty before God, to show us our guilt, right? So that we would appreciate the gift the new covenant is, all right? In addition, it was also to point to Jesus. These were all shadows. The feast days, they all point to Jesus. The sacrifices, they all point to Jesus. Now, in these rituals, these dead religious works, as it's called, there is no righteousness because it's a shadow, you see. The problem is people are trying to gain righteousness by keeping food laws. And food laws are pointing to Jesus, okay? Uh, unleavened bread, for instance. Let's say you can't, you're not supposed to eat unleavened bread or whatever. This unleavened bread is a picture of the bread of life, Jesus Christ. Leaven represents sin, right? So does not eating uh, bread with yeast in it make you have righteousness before god no what does the real bread of life without leaven that's jesus being in christ so see the food itself pointed to something that 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 food is a shadow of what will make you righteous can eat unclean foods oh that points to christ eat my flesh and drink my blood does he want you to literally do that? Of course not. He said, my words, they are spirit and they are life. So understanding, don't eat these unclean foods. Why? Look, look, is the pig and the shrimp. They're scavengers. They're unclean. They eat junk, which means the flesh is dirty or defiled. Jesus has no sin. Once again, that food is pointing to Jesus Christ. This is why there's no righteousness in the shadow. Okay. So we're going to look at that, and I'm going to give you one verse, and then we'll get to the next section. In the Hebrew, We're going to be looking at Hebrews 9 and 10. 10 says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. See, we're perfected forever. These were shadows pointing us to Christ. That's why there's no righteousness to be found in these. Sabbath, that's the rest we have in Christ. There's no righteousness in the Sabbath day any longer. Because we're not, first of all, we're not in that covenant. It, unless you can keep the whole of the law, it's pointless. But also because that Sabbath is a picture of the rest we have in Christ and God resting uh, in creation, which is also a shadow of Christ. If you can see everything as being Jesus, you'll understand why there's no righteousness in it. Nothing of eternal value. And that's what all of Hebrews is trying to say. You guys come out of the shadow and into the image of the thing that it's pointing to so you can receive righteousness. As I feared, my other section was lost. I'm trying to retrieve part of it. So I'm just doing this, the rest of it on a regular camera. It is Hebrews chapter 9, uh, starting at verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Once again, whole book of Hebrews trying to show the new covenant is a superior covenant. The new high priest, the everlasting, ever-living high priest is greater than the high priest of the old covenant. How it's all superior because that covenant was never going to gain righteousness for man. It was pointing to Jesus and what would save, what would give righteousness. All these things are shadows. 
So the whole thing is trying to tell them to come out of that so that they can understand the purpose of it and why this is, you got to get, get rid of it. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold. You'll see I put a picture up here. Wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant, which is the Ten Commandments stones. Uh, and over it, the cherubim of glory shadowing the mercy seat. That's one angel here, one angel here. God's manifest presence in the middle. That's the tomb of Jesus, a shadow of the tomb of Jesus. When the women walked into the tomb, there was one angel sitting at the foot and one at the head. That is the mercy seat of the ark. God's manifest presence in the middle where he would have been laying, but he had risen. Okay. Uh, the cherubs of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. So there's not enough time to even speak of that. What, what he's saying is it's very complex and it's amazing. Uh, now these things were thus ordained. The priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone. Once every year, not without blood, he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. So he was not a perfect high priest without sin. He had sin and had to offer a sacrifice for himself first before he could even make sacrifices for the people. Which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Which was a figure for the time then present. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. Look at this. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing which was a figure for the time then present that the temple all of it pointing to christ the veil remember it says that is to say his flesh ripped from top to bottom that's why he was scourged i did a video showing a superimposition of his scourged back over the veil that was the rip in his flesh. We can come boldly to the throne. I always wanted to know. And that was answered for me a couple of weeks ago. And I was overwhelmed. I, when I get revelation like this, it just brings me such joy. Such joy. That's why he had to be scourged. The veil was ripped. Wow. So representing we can come boldly to the throne of God. There's no longer something separating the people from God's presence. So, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now, I said tonight on CES, most people still don't get this. See, the Jews were thinking year by year continually they had to keep offering blood of bulls and goats, right? Not realizing that was just a covering. It was a 
covered until the sacrifice could come. God is outside of time. I said earlier, he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He's outside of time. It was already done in God's eyes. It allowed him to interact with man because these sacrifices were really Jesus' sacrifice. They were pointing to, that's the only reason God could be in their presence. It's also the reason you you could not, you can't bring strange fire to the Lord. People are like, oh, it's harsh. They came to the Holy of Holies and oh, it's called strange fire. It means uh, something that was not asked by God, not done in the way God asked it to be done, not when, didn't come when they were supposed to. It was not an ordained time. It was not nothing. They, they, they came in there unritually clean. Okay. Why did they die? Because that sacrifice did not point to Jesus as sacrifice. That's why they dropped dead. Are you seeing this picture yet? This is why God was able to to interact with mankind still in sin because he's outside of time and Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We see that reference in, with Adam and Eve. They slew an animal, right? It's pointing to it there. Because he's outside of time, all these old covenant sacrifices who did not, he said in um, sacrifices and offerings thou hast had no pleasure because it's not in those it's not in animals dying that brings God uh, satisfaction it's that his own son did that for us the perfect sacrifice paid in full done but those sacrifices were pointing to him it's so the the people could recognize the one that did bring these were just just shadows of the image but when the image came, they rejected him and stayed in the shadows. Makes no sense. They didn't see it was pointing to him. It says was a figure for the time then present. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. But they, they couldn't make the conscience perfect. See, the Jews kept thinking year by year continually. Got to keep applying the blood. Got to keep applying the blood. No, God never was pleased with those sacrifices. But Jesus, and you'll see it in Hebrews 10. I'm not going to go over it tonight. He died once for all. Once for all. And the conscience is going to tell us here is perfect. It should be perfect, cleared. No walking around in condemnation thinking, oh, I need another sacrifice there. And that's what the Catholics do with the mass. Got to reapply the blood. Got to reapply the blood. Got to re... No. Once for all, perfected forever. This is the good news of the gospel, people. Uh, let's look at this. But Christ. All right, here it goes. Uh, I got to finish. So it says pertaining to the conscience, right? It could not make the conscience perfect, which stood only in meat and drinks and diverse watchings and carnal ordinances. Taste not, touch not, handle not. Don't eat this. Don't touch that. Imposed on them until the time of Reformation. I want you to go over to Colossians chapter 2. I want to show you something Paul's trying to explain to them. Now, this is because Judaizers consistently came in trying to insist on being physically circumcised. And we see in other places where Paul says, we are the circumcision. We're the ones who worship in spirit and in truth. Those of us who boast in the cross of Christ and have no confidence at all in the flesh. Okay. So th this is not just circumcision. It's food laws and the feast days and all of this law and all in it, all pointed to Christ. There is no righteousness to be had before God in keeping this this is pointing to what will the real thing that will make you righteous and it's Jesus as I explained so look they can't get it through their head and I, I want you to see this so you can be set free now if you want to keep them you are free
If you don't want to keep them, you are free. We are not in bondage. Everything we do, do it unto the Lord. But it's not getting righteousness. You're not condemned if you don't. And you're not gaining righteousness before God if you do. Do you understand? Okay. Whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. Right? So, let's see. Colossians chapter 2. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Rudiments of the world, fleshly ordinances. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. See, it's all about our bodies and making sure we don't eat this and do that. Okay, no, we're in Christ and the fullness of the Godhead dwells within him. He is in us and we are in him. The Godhead is bodily. Him, that's the body. We're the body. It's not about eating it and drinking and all this stuff. It's pointing to Jesus. Are you seeing the picture here? And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Do you get it? Because the fullness of the Godhead bodily is Jesus Christ. You're not lacking. You don't have to make up for it because it's his body. Get it? In whom ye also are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. See, circumcision of the body was a picture of of the circumcision of the heart. God removes this dead flesh body, sinful flesh from us. That is not who we are. All right. So that's why it can't be undone. Can you put skin back on a circumcised? <clears throat> no, you can't. You can't put the dead flesh back on a new born again child of God. Because we are in Christ and he is in us. We are, our whole identity is Christ. Not what we do, but what he did. You see, that's why we have his righteousness, not infused righteousness, imputed, put on our account, buried with him in baptism. That's why I keep saying Jesus got baptized. Did he have to? Was he a sinner? No. Did he need to be born again? No. He's God manifesting. Why did he get baptized? I must fulfill all righteousness. Thief on the cross didn't get baptized. So what? We're buried with him in baptism. I am for baptism. I got baptized. The first work of obedience after you're saved. It's a public proclamation of our faith that we died, we're buried, and rose again with him. Amen. I believe it. But the water is not cleansing you. It's the blood of Christ. Holy Spirit baptism is the one that saves. That's the one we are baptized into Christ by the Spirit. Water baptism is a picture of that. Okay. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh has he quickened together with him or brought him brought you to life. This new person. It is an event. Somebody asked me to do a video on it. I will. I'm really behind. Having forgiven you all trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man, therefore, judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holiday. That's what holy day is. Holiday. It's, it's, it's a short form of holy day. Or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, keeping them or not. You get it? Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward and voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. I have a video on that. Intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. 
and not holding the head, from which all the body, by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. Wherefore, if we be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you yet subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. This is an entirely new covenant. It's not some of it or a reformed covenant. It's a brand new living way. These things pointed to Jesus. Don't drag that stuff in here thinking it's bringing you righteousness. It's a shadow of Christ. It's a shadow of the righteousness. So you'll just have a shadow of righteousness, not true righteousness. It does nothing. Does nothing. But point to the way of righteousness. Just like John the Baptist was a voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord. This prepared his way. It bore witness to him, his attributes, what he would accomplish. This cried out. This is a witness. The law is a witness against you. It says that over and over again. Why is the law a witness? Because we didn't keep it. No, not just that. Because the law points to Jesus. It's a witness against them because they're trying to find righteousness in the shadow, forsaking the thing the shadow pointed to. You see? So, carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. This is another reason salvation cannot be lost. I've said over and over again, Hebrews is one of the greatest eternal security books if people would stop taking it out of context. The whole point is to show the Hebrew people, catch up! You're in the shadows. You're falling into the same example of unbelief that your forefathers did when I said I'd give them the promised land. Now you don't believe I'm giving you the real promised land And are doubting. You're going to lose out too. They didn't enter into my rest. And neither will you. That's the whole point. And if you forsook Moses' law. How much worse you think he's going to be. If you reject his son. That's the point. Can you see it? Okay. So. It. If you go to a pawn shop. To redeem an item. So you drop off a TV. And uh, you're pawning it, right? You get uh, 50 bucks for a nice flat screen, right? And they say you got 30 days to redeem the item or we're going to sell it, all right? So you're pawning it. You're giving them a, an item that's worth more than the money they give you, but you're only having them hold it for collateral until you can give them the payment of the loan back. If you don't come back in 30 days or 60 days or whatever, then they sell your item, Right. But usually people will pawn something with the intention of just making it to payday. And they'll come back with the 50 bucks plus the fee, right? The interest or whatever. And they redeem the item. All right? So they put the money on there and go, let me redeem my item. And it's paid. And they go home with it. Now, since Jesus didn't buy us with gold, silver, precious stones or any type of monetary earthly thing, but by his own precious blood to redeem us. See, this is the message of the gospel people don't get. Once for all, paid the sin debt, rose again, proving that if we trust him, we'll rise too. Why? Because he paid the debt that we owed, the wages of our sin, which is death. Uh, So, It's really unfortunate because he obtained eternal redemption. So if his blood purchased me, how do you lose that? Does he get a refund? Here, take her back. He paid with his blood. So the only kind of redemption Jesus has for us is eternal. You're not redeemed and then tossed back. If you're saved... You stay that way. And by the way, 
We are the circumcision. So he's already cut our flesh from us. That guy is dead. And that's the whole point. We're supposed to acknowledge we died with Christ and are alive in him. Unto righteousness. That's our point. See, we're the elect. We're, we're, we're ordained to bless others. We're used as a vehicle of blessing. That's what Christians are. We missed it. He only offers eternal redemption. That's what he obtained for us. That is the good news. The reason we don't die is because he redeemed us by his own blood. Good news of the gospel. You'll never die. Look what he did for you. Well, I don't believe that. Then don't. Stay lost. I don't care. I mean, people just want to reject it and find all these reasons why you can lose it. You want to find a reason to glory in your flesh. I'm sorry. I pray the Lord breaks you with the law and its heavy standards. If you hate a brother without a cause, it's murder. In thought, word, and deed, perfection. Nobody is bringing God anything that impresses him. His son pleases him. That's it. None, nothing else. You want to please God? Trust a completely in Jesus. It's all him. That way, when you mess up, you don't go, did I lose it? Am I really saved? It's not about you. He knows you're flawed. That's why you needed a lamb to begin with. The sinner brings the lamb because he's not good. That's the point. But he is. A eternal redemption. Eternal redemption. I want people so much to get this. <laughs> the good news of the gospel is the proclamation that death is swallowed up in victory. Jesus proved he has power over death. He is the resurrection and the life. He paid the wages of our sin, which is death. Every person is sinned. So believe in him. Trust him to get you there. Because he did it. Now, while you're here... Follow your master. Let him live in you and be an example because it's good and profitable unto men. It gives God uh, glory, but not to save you. Come on. They are just mixing it all up. The glorious message is gone. Paul said, even in his lifetime, in tears, he warned him. The men were going to come in with, don't eat this, can't be married, just all kinds of twisting up stuff. Work salvation. It's, it's, just, it's just sad. They miss what he's done. All he suffered. Ugh. And it's not until you trust Christ, the Holy Spirit's in you. I really want people to get this. And I believe it's your, your heart is for the Lord and you've come to a place where you know you're a sinner and you need a Savior. If you don't fully understand it, keep at it. Pray the Lord. Ask him to open your eyes and help you get an understanding of it. But if you're worried because you know the gospel, you understand it clearly, but you hear a preacher and he upsets you, he's, he's geared to, to shipwreck your faith. Everything in this world is geared to shipwreck our faith. You must wear the full armor of God. And I'm going to do a video on the helmet of salvation there's a reason our helmets the helmet of salvation something's always trying to make you think you're not saved but we need to know that john tells us that knowing we have eternal life actually helps us continue to believe on jesus I tell you these things that believe on the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name jesus christ you do believe, so you know you have eternal life. I'm telling you, you have it because you trust in him. And because you know you have eternal life, you can, can help you continue to believe in Jesus Christ for it. Because it's a big circle of completion. Do not let anyone steal your joy, your love, and your peace. I don't care what they bring you. And you'll get to that place eventually. You'll be like, oh yeah, I'm not saved. Why now? <laughs> yeah, okay. Good luck with that. Pretty soon, it's, it's, it's not going to, you'll, you'll get to it. It's like, that's nonsense. We know what he's trusting in. It's Jesus. Did he do it or he didn't? Period. 
So it's just ridiculous. The only way you're not saved is if Christ be not risen, we are yet in our sins. But we know he rose. All right. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered into once. Into, why do you do it once? Wasn't necessary to do it anymore. His blood was an overpayment. He's so precious. Because he obtained eternal redemption. It paid enough for us to be redeemed eternally. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. Now, if dirty animals uh, made your flesh ritually clean enough to be able to enter into God's presence in your fallen state, then how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We can't serve God until we know our conscience is clear. It's done because you, you've got to know this because that's how you receive the sealing of the Holy Spirit. It's got to, the foundation is Jesus alone. It's all him. That's what he's saying. If that cleansed you ritually in your flesh to be able to present yourself before God, how much more is God manifest in the flesh who offered his own blood without sin? Do you realize this is an eternal being, self-existing, omniscient, that came and experienced death as a payment for us? And what are we going to do that's going to impress God better than that? No, it's done. Eternal redemption was achieved for us. What's left? Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. It's a gift you receive. How do you do that? By God's grace through the vehicle of faith. Faith is to believe that what God promised he's able to perform. That's what the Bible says faith is. It says it's that and it's the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So do you believe he obtained it? Because he did. Then receive it by believing it. Eternal redemption. I don't care how these people argue. Dan Corner and damned Corner. I think that's what Jack Smith calls him. Uh, You know, I don't care what they say. Let God be true and every man a liar. I, I want the saints to walk in power and joy and love and to bless God. And be a blessing to this world. I am so sick of religiosity. I am sick every night. I'll go to bed and I'll look and I'll see what what kind of ministry is happening tonight. I'll go to bed listening to ministry. Screaming at gay pride parades, which is really just, look at me. I'm suffering for the cause of Christ. I'm getting yelled at and called names. But nobody's getting saved. What's the point of it? What's the point of it? I become all things to all people that I might save some, Paul said. Find a way to relate to people. Don't stand on a soapbox looking down your nose at people. It's hard to look down at people when you're washing their feet. Okay. I'm on a rant. Somebody needs some sleep. (laughs) I love you guys. I hope, I hope this gave you um, some peace. I'm going to read this one last thing. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. Do you see that? What, what, why, why was that First Testament there? I mean, the promise is here. And then the New Covenant is the promise. The promise. Came. Why do we get a, a First Covenant in between the actual covenant? We needed to see our need for the gift we needed to see the need for the promise see and the law helps us because it makes sin exceedingly sinful it says right here 
for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance for where a testament is there must also of necessity be the death of the testator that's another uh, proof text for jesus being god so uh in any case i i hope that it gave you some joy and that you you have some peace and um sorry i got fired up i i love the gospel i'm not mad at anyone <laughs> i just i hate every false way that's all um love you guys see you soon god bless